we have been forging and casting for thousands of years, to be honest. Yeah. So there's a ton of experience with these processes and um, no one really, or not many really question them anymore these days. But additive manufacturing only has been becoming like popular 20 years ago. And I think the very big leaps in additive manufacturing have only been done the last five or 10 years. So there's still a ton of things to learn. Hey everybody, I'm Jonathan from Autodesk. I'm an inventor, maker, designer, uh, and I also host this show, Shop Talk. Um, today, we're speaking with Stefan Herman. You probably know him as CNC Kitchen. Um, if you're new to 3D printing, you've never used a 3D printer before, he's got a great channel that'll get you started. If you're way beyond advanced and you wanna know about engineering properties for materials and processes, he's got a great channel for you. And we're gonna have a good conversation today. Stefan, uh, for people who don't know you, uh, tell us about yourself. Yeah, well, my name is Stefan. I run the uh, YouTube channel CNC Kitchen. Um, even though it's called CNC Kitchen, it doesn't have to do that much with like CNCing. Uh, I do a ton of 3D printing. Um, I'm an engineer myself. I still work two days a week um, in aerospace research, also doing like additive manufacturing. And uh, kind of the work that I did there at some point got me into making YouTube videos and, and finding my niche where I was able to thrive over the last years and uh, where I was able to now gather almost half a million subscribers, which is really nice. Cool. Yeah. Can you, can you give us a little more detail on your day job? Yeah, so I'm um, so I started as a structural engineer um, at a aerospace supplier here in Germany. Um, I used to be, or I used to do structural analysis for um, aircraft landing gears. Uh, did that for a couple of years, um, then did a master's in um, numerical analysis, and that kind of even got me even deeper into. Uh, structural analysis, topology optimization, um, all of that stuff. And with me buying a 3D printer at home, I got also into additive manufacturing. And at that point, a department was founded in our company um, dealing with additive manufacturing, not like on a consumer level or consumer machines, but with uh, powder bed machines trying to pr produce aerospace parts for well, trying to produce aerospace parts with additive manufacturing, with powder bed 3D printing out of titanium, and then really getting them into uh, into commercial aircraft, which is kind of a challenge, to be honest. And uh, we were quite successful in that regard. And we introduced our, I think, first serial production parts apart, uh, I think even almost three or four years back. Um, and uh, yeah, so... This is my day job. Um, and with basically the work as a structural engineer and with the work in additive manufacturing research in my normal job, that kind of also got me into, well, doing YouTube videos in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that connection, like how your day job informs your YouTube channel? So... Basically, I early I, I realized quite early that I'm German and I'm probably not funny. So, <laughs> i i had I had to find uh, a a different niche uh, doing YouTube videos. Well, to be honest, being a big YouTuber never really was my plan initially. So, uh, when I was a structural engineer and bought my first three D printer at home, I always had the problem that I printed parts, but I did not have any material data on these parts to evaluate if they are fit for the job. And I realized that there isn't a ton of information around. I read a ton of scientific papers on FDM 3D printing and the material properties of FDM 3D printed parts, but most of them were just garbage because I always had the feeling that unfortunately it's always it's it's often the case that 
some of those researchers, they might not have as much as a passion in additive manufacturing when they are doing this research. Um, so I thought, yeah, this might be a niche um, where I could do something. So I built my first, so I built myself a tensile testing machine, uh, printed the first samples and then just ripped them apart um, and then evaluated them in the material data. And I thought, yeah, may maybe there's also somebody else around who might be interested in that data. I've always been watching YouTube videos for like many, many years and YouTube tutorials and just lectures in general was always something that I really enjoyed watching myself or listening to. So I thought um, YouTube might be the right platform to also like contribute to. And uh, people found the the work that I did obviously interesting, um, material testing, comparing different materials, uh, trying to find uh, print settings to uh, print as strong as possible and things like that. Um, it's just something that I've always been working on. People seem to enjoy that. And uh, yeah, this is basically how I um, how I grew my channel. And uh, this is kind of what I'm no known for doing 3D printing research on a more casual level um, and trying to educate and also a bit entertain um, my viewers in additive manufacturing and engineering in general. Yeah, you've been very successful at that. Um, I mean, it's your your content is really accessible for someone like me who doesn't have a background in structural engineering. Um, but it's I don't know you've you've got a real talent for it. I'm glad you kind of chose this path as opposed to you know sticking with a day job doing the nine to five thing. Um, it's kind of it's kind of self ther therapy for me because in the past I often worked on projects, but I don't know always just doing like. 80% of the work, 90% uh, of the work, never really documenting, uh, documenting ever, uh, something. So YouTube is self-therapy in that way that it requires me to do a project, finish a project, do the documentation on it and, and release everything, which is kind of a nice thing. Yeah, you, it's it's got to be satisfying. At the end, you've got like a fully packaged product where you've kind of, you know, explored everything you need to. And yeah got something really valuable for everybody. Um, yeah. So what made you decide to use Fusion on your channel? Uh, basically, when I started, this was one very powerful yet free for the maker software that I was able to use. So I, I am a mechanical engineer. I did design work for for many many years so i knew how to work with professional parametric cat software so when i started my channel i had to find something where i can work efficiently but it's also not horribly expensive for me to use because as a maker as a as just a, a home shop guy i can't afford or i couldn't afford in the beginning paying like a thousand bucks every year for for cat software and fusion 360 at that point uh was a just a very powerful option and especially also with well um with me not only not like not purely doing 3d printing but also do, doing a bit of manufacturing having capabilities of designing but also cam so uh making g code for for my my cnc router was very powerful because then i did not have to change uh between different software packages and uh, i could very quickly iterate between like changing a design then it automatically adjusts um my 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 manufacturing workflow which was really nice and it's still really nice of course <laughs> um this is shop talk so we have to talk about your shop so uh, where is it? What's the story behind it? How does it work? Is it where you want it to be? Anything you want to change there or add to it? You, you mentioned a, a tour mock. Maybe you've got one of those in the future. So yeah, of course, mainly I have 3D printers in there. I love to use FFF FDM 3D printing because it's not as messy as resin, but I also have like a, a stinky room for, for my resin printing, which is kind of nice because I just didn't want to do that at home before. Uh, I currently 
dive a bit more into CNC work again, because I think that is something that is really um, satisfying if it's if, if it's working, because it's just such a nice physical process with all of the chips that you're producing and just something different that is challenging me, um, of course, on like smaller machines compared to the ones that you have in the background. But having a, a space for myself hopefully gives me the opportunity in the future to um, work with bigger machines, maybe more professional machines, to either do research with them or just to use them to fulfill the needs that are required in my projects. There, in our previous conversation, so uh, there, this um, research project came up where you were talking about trying to find one product to fit all your needs. Could you uh, enlighten us a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I, I can maybe elaborate that, that um, on that a little bit. So um, I think one of the challenges that I find in my normal job is if we design parts for additive manufacturing, it is there's a very close connection between like uh, boundary conditions, initial design, uh, generative design, um, then uh creating a build job from that um adding support structures and then also take taking that um 3d printed part and do uh, manufacturing on that and uh what we always struggled with was that we kind of used individual tools for all of these steps so you had one tool where you did for example uh initial design work then you uh, went into another tool where you did topology optimization. Then you went into a third tool where you did, um, where where you kind of interpreted your um, topology optimized design. Then you got back into normal CAD where you did all of the the boundaries and things like that. Then you uh, then you have the analysis step and yada yada yada. So it is a it was a very complex workflow. Of course, we had the advantage that we could choose the best tool for each of the steps. But we had so many interfaces in between that organizing the data was kind of hard. And when you kind of had a final design, but you wanted to iterate on it, you had to go back uh, to the beginning. And since there isn't any connectivity between those tools, basically the amount of work that you had to put into all of the um, all of the iteration steps was kind of almost as much as doing um, uh, a complete design from the beginning so that slowed down um, our work or that slowed down our workflow. Initial design was okay, but every iteration it took so, 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 so long. So um, we, we did a research project trying to find a process chain for additive manufacturing where we, where you, where we basically have like one tool which is able to do all of the steps that are necessary to um, kind of design, analyze, uh, support, and also manufacture in the end a, a 3D printable uh, part, which is kind of hard because there are a lot of boundary conditions that, that have to be met and there aren't a lot of tools on the market that are able to do that. But in the end, we kind of showed that using a platform suite that is able to implement everything uh, we could in the beginning already speed up the design workflow because we did not have to change between uh, different softwares by like 20 30 percent but if we did an iteration we were like 70 70 uh, percent faster which was uh, really nice because uh, that gave us the possibility to either be quicker done with the design or to use the, the time that we have for more iterations to get a better design um, out of our workflow in the end. 70% faster. 70% faster. Yeah, just, just because with our conventional tool chain, redesign or doing an iteration of a part is kind of the same amount of work as starting from scratch again, which is a real pain. And if you have a platform tool that supports all of the steps in, in your process chain you change something in the beginning and ideally you just hit one button and and everything is done for you again of course there are some maybe some interfaces that change but that's way easier to to adjust and to adapt as if you are always working with like neutral formats in the middle and you have to manually export something and import it again which is which is a pain and uh yeah this is the reason 
why or this is one of the reasons why we were able to to save such a huge amount of time that's amazing i, I wouldn't i mean i i assumed it would be faster but 70 percent that's crazy um yeah. well that's that's what we want to hear um <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i've i've noticed that a lot of your videos are in the style of like an experiment you know they're they're research projects um why did you decide to structure the content that way um, and then, so that's part of it, part of the question. And then the second part is, uh, who's the ideal viewer? And I, I'm, I'm assuming those things are kind of connected. Um, I try to find video ideas and video projects that are also interesting for me. So I have an initial question, uh, for example, how can I print a transparent part with an FDM 3d printer? So this is the initial question. And then I start um, just doing like general research, what's already available. And then I go into uh, doing experiments myself. And I think this is kind of nicely shows how research or structured research also works in like a, a real research program. <laughs> um, because... You start with an idea, uh, try it out, and then iterate until you get to a final design, uh, well, to, to a final conclusion, and then uh, basically uh, decide if it's good or if if it wasn't good. the uh, The ideal viewer for me um, is I always try to cater to beginners, but also to experts. A beginner, I try to. Um, start quite easy so that a beginner is not directly um, annoyed by the amount of detail and maybe engineering skills that might be required. Um, and I always have the idea or I always want that even an uninformed viewer learns something during the, pro during the process. Maybe at like 50, 60, 70% of the video, they might not understand everything anymore, but they still were able to, to learn something, to uh, try to see how this scientific approach works and be happy with the result in the end. But then on the other hand, I also have my informed viewers that might be a bit, I don't know, bored in the beginning. But uh, also for these, I want to go into details in the end um, where they might have experience um, on their own and maybe even post that in comments because that also helps myself. Um, but still try to teach them something in the end because nobody can know everything um, and they're experts in, in many different fields. I would describe myself as a um, check of many trades, but a master of none. Uh, so I I always know that there are more informed people out there uh, and I'm always happy about the, the input that I'm getting. But with projects that require knowledge in in different fields i still want to teach also somebody who uh, who is has very deep knowledge in a certain field um, um something in the end and uh, be be happy with the project that i did yeah you've done a really good job of making stuff not intimidating for a beginner and then interesting for basically everybody um and they're not too, um, I don't know, they're, your videos are very concise too. It's, it's um, you know, to the point, entertaining. You don't linger on anything too long. I, I really, you know, it's it's no surprise that it's grown to what it is now. And it seems to be continuing to grow from what I can tell. So yeah, additive metals. And the advantage there being that if you do like a laser centered powder bed titanium part, you you can be you can pretty much be sure that it's just a monolithic part, right? That it's it, this is really no different than say casting something. Um, are, what what are the applications for um, for aerospace with that? Like we've seen projects where there's you know a bracket somewhere that's done with additive metal, and you're able to lightweight it, and it's you can you can only manufacture it in additive, and because you know, airplanes are so expensive and fuel costs so much and they last so long that over time you've got, it actually makes sense to like, you know, to do that part in additive. 
But um, without, you know, obviously like you, you I wouldn't get you into an uh, NDA situation, but um, <laughs> what are, what are some of the parts that you would, that in your day job you normally work with and how do you test those? Well, may, maybe to first answer the first part of the question, um, I, th I think initially uh, when we started using additive manufacturing for, for aerospace, we have seen a ton of applications where we had a conventional part and tried to make that in additive, um, sometimes saving a bit of weight because we can, for example, on a manifold, we can leave material away where before uh, it just conventionally wasn't able to be removed. Um, but you kind of quickly learn that there aren't a ton of application where, where this makes really sense because additive manufacturing is still like a very expensive technology. But um, finding these parts, especially those unicorn parts, which might have been very expensive, conventionally manufactured, and now are way cheaper additively manufactured uh, because they're so complex to manufacture or the materials might be so hard to manufacture, um, gives us a way to learn how we can use additive manufacturing in well how we can industrialize additive manufacturing with simple parts with parts that we where we can do easy qc on where maybe uh, the volumes are not that high to at some point get to the point uh where you can use additive manufacturing to replace maybe convention uh sorry complex um, assemblies because i think this is where additive manufacturing can really shine uh because before you might have had a part that is welded together out of like 10 15 20 100 individual parts and now you can print that as a monolithic 3d printed part maybe even at uh lower uh lower weight and um getting rid of the additional work, welding that part together might also save you um, in, in money in the end or it might save you money in the end. And uh, But until we get to that point, we need to still learn how to properly um, apply additive manufacturing in industry, in industrialized parts, uh, how to do proper QC and how we can find assembly where this, assemblies where this really makes sense. And uh, I think, to get to to the second part, how do we do we test this part? How do we test these parts? Of course, we do like the same testing as on conventionally manufactured parts in terms of like qualification. So we load the parts over and over and over again and see if they fail or not. But also, uh, we also do like coupon testing. Uh, we do coupon testing on every print job just to see if the material properties are as we expect them to be. If they uh, or and if they don't differ between like different batches, different heat treatment cycles, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then uh, QC, especially with like CT scanning or, or X-ray scanning is still very important. We do know that, for example, power to bed manufactured titanium parts are very dense after they uh, have been printed. But um, since we only have been 3D printing titanium for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, we still need to make sure that we can keep that quality or achieve that quality. And um, CT scanning or X-ray scanning is just a, a very important technology that can make sure that there are no voids in the part. Uh, we can use CT scanning even to do metrology on the parts. So we can take a look uh, on the inside of the parts, see if the geometry is on the inside, see if the dimensions match. And um, this is also part of QC checking and testing of the parts if they are fit for, for application. Um, but unfortunately, still, I think in aerospace, ah, weight or in commercial aircrafts, weight is not as important as money in the end. <laughs> Oil is still too cheap. I think uh, currently 3D printing especially shines in space applications because like every pound that you're saving on a part is another pound that you can shoot in space. And shooting one pound of, of, of mass into space is usually way more expensive than... Um, is way more expensive than saving a pound on a 3D printed part, for example. Sure. 
Yeah, I'd always kind of thought of it in terms of two things, light weighting and then dealing with geometries that are kind of prohibitively, uh, I don't know, the, that the geometry becomes a problem when you're doing conventional manufacturing, like it's subtractive stuff. Um, but that's really interesting. I never thought about if you've got 100 parts that have to be welded together, there's a quality control issue because every weld is, is another potential uh, breaking point, right? Like there could be some little imperfection in that weld somewhere. Um, whereas if you do it with additive, you can more or less count on it being what it's supposed to be, right? Yeah, there are a lot of technologies that we are already using these days to also check those additive parts being like um, X-ray and CT scanning. But we, for example, also do in situ monitoring of the melt pool to make sure that um, the 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 printing process was okay. If If you're thinking about what powder bed manufacturing is it's just like a very very long weld that you're producing so for example sample on like a, a one kilo part you have uh 10 miles of weld that in a way you also need to qc um and in situ monitoring is is something that you can use for that um but also like checking other things and using other technologies to make sure um that that everything is all right and just having and maybe also just having the um having worked with the technology for a while uh the experience with the process can also uh help to uh qualify these parts that they are fit for the application yeah, but it's it's not as easy as as it might sound. If you have a ton of money, you can buy a, a powder bed printer, um, which can produce really nice parts. But that doesn't say that these parts that you're getting out of the machine are fit for it for, for example, aerospace applications. Because you need to qualify the process. You need to know how um, the parameters of the machine can change over time and how that affects part quality. And this is something that, uh, well, for example, we as a company are still learning every day and learned over the last years. Um, and this gives us the experience um, to produce parts for aer aerospace, for example. That must be exciting. I mean, you're, you're doing something that's so, it's so new. I mean, additive yeah. manufacturing is just, it's, it's, the, it's a big frontier. It's very cool. Um, if you're thinking about, we have been forging and casting for thousands of years, to be honest. Yeah. So there's a ton of experience with these processes and um, no one really, or not many really question them anymore these days. But additive manufacturing only has been becoming like popular 20 years ago. And I think the very big leaps in additive manufacturing have only been done the last five or 10 years. So there's still a ton of things to learn but we also are still lacking a ton of experience to use the technology to its full potential yeah and this that this might be a segue into the next question but um you know you're what you're doing with your youtube channel you wouldn't be doing it if you didn't think it was important um so why do you think it's important for people to learn about additive manufacturing the great thing about additive manufacturing is, and especially on, I think on a hobby level, because this is something that I kind of promote on my YouTube channel, is that it is a technology that enables us to have an idea, um, design that idea in CAD, and with just basically the click of a button, get a physical part out of the um, out of out of the three D printing process, and this is something that is so important for me. Um, and I think with no real other technology before we, we really had that ad advantage because, um, of course many were able to use like cat, but barely anyone either had a CNC router or a CNC mill to uh, produce a physical part or was able to use it. And uh, 3d printing has been becoming so easy to use and approachable that even a beginner who never did any never did any physical parts can now just buy a machine print a part out and have something physical in their hand and if they understand the process if they selected the right materials uh, even make functional parts with the technology yeah so personally i've done a lot of 3d printing over the past 10 years or so um there a lot of the yeah i mean it's the big advantage of it 
for, you know, a, a product designer basically is that you, you can very quickly get a complex part that doesn't require a lot of steps in manufacturing, right? So like I could probably do most of these things on my CNC router, but you're talking about multiple uh, setups, different work holding, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of effort that goes into making something that way. Um, let's see. So one of the, one of the projects I made is this, um, it's like a animation machine. So you turn this crank and there's a bunch of gears and it's, it does like a, you know, a, a Geneva, um, gear. Right. And then that, that creates the shutter. It's like what the, uh, you know, the, some of the first, um, film projectors worked that way. And I made all the brackets with, um, 3d printed parts. They were all on a FFF machine. Um, and the, the, the material I chose was uh, matte fiber PLA from uh, protopasta. I don't know if you've ever used that stuff. Yep. Um, the cool thing about it is it, it has this matte finish to it, right? So like most FFF 3D printing you do, um, the, the layers show up and they're shiny. And like this, this was an art piece that was going in a gallery. So I needed it to, to look a certain way. Um, and it worked great for a while. And then it started to delaminate, right? So like... The matte fiber stuff looks awesome, but the fibers themselves have uh, their structural uh, consequences there. Um, you've done a lot, a lot of the stuff on your channel um, that I really like is these, the, the scenarios where you're testing, not just materials and the way they behave, but like the way, the way a part is designed. So designed for manufacturing specifically for 3D printing. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Design for manufacturing, like what are what are some of the considerations that that you um, try to get people to think about that maybe they're not? I think quite early I realized that you can only well that you can especially use three D printing to its full potential if you know about the constraints of additive manufacturing, be it design for additive manufacturing. So how how should you? right in the beginning orient your part that um, your layers are not in line with the load direction so that they don't delaminate right in the beginning uh, if you have more complex parts maybe even cut them into several pieces glue them back together again as 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 stupid as that sounds with 3d printing but if you want to use 3D printing to its full potential, know how your load travels through your part um, and try to orient those parts right in the beginning of your design process in a way that they are uh, properly printable and that they can withstand the, the load properly. And I think this is, this is something that many really need to understand. I think for me, it's kind of obvious just due to my background as a structural engineer, but I try to communicate things like that as well, that um, the process itself has different properties and different loading directions. And especially if you're using materials that are, for example, fiber reinforced and those fibers, they orient in the print direction, in the direction that your nozzle travels. So... Uh, that the properties of your final part are very dependent on your on your printing direction, and uh, if this is and if you want to do functional parts, this is something that you need to consider right in the beginning. Yeah, I don't know your your channel is is really cool because you've got all these experiments and there's so much there to learn about 3D printing. Um, but you've also got this kind of uh, you've got a store that goes along with uh, CNC Kitchen, where you've found um, basically the best bang for the buck products that help you do not just 3D printing as, you know, fun little widgets and stuff. It's like, these are the really good heat inserts that will give you the best structural properties if you need to make some kind of functional part. Um, what else are you cooking up in the CNC Kitchen? <laughs> so I, I kind of early noticed that... Uh, if 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 you want to do science videos and and be a YouTuber, YouTube ad revenue YouTube ad revenue can't be something you can really rely on because that can fluctuate quite a bit over time. So at some point we we thought about what might be a good what might be a 
some what might be a project that or not a project what might be a product that fits to my channel uh which uh we can source in high quality do uh qc ourselves and that we can sell to to our viewers that they can use for example 3d printing to really its full potential and for example the heat set inserts make parts that are way more functional than they used to be before so uh this was like an obvious choice but uh bringing products onto the market is tough it requires a ton of time a ton of work and a ton of money to be honest so we're we're slowly like trying to get into um, other products that are kind of relatable uh related to uh what i do on the channel be it tools for i don't know work on your 3d printed parts or tools how to uh properly insert those heat set inserts into your parts um which i can use in my videos and hopefully also the viewers like and can of course buy and then also support the, the channel that way because that just helps us diversify um, our income stream and makes our income a bit more stable than it used to be in the beginning because you never know what happens to youtube and google and and things like that totally yeah so um so what's the five-year plan would you say oh I never wanted to be self-employed, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I I uh, don't ask me about something like that. I don't know. I I, I still want to do like research videos as as I do nowadays. I'm currently still kind of a one-man show, so the product business is done um, in cooperation with a, a business partner of mine. But the the videos that I do are still done my, by myself. So if I would think about where do I want to be in five years is I want to have a team which does all of the things I don't like. I'm currently doing taxes. I need to do bookkeeping. Um, I want to have writers. I want to have people that might work on products um, and um, which I can, which I can, talk to and just bounce ideas around because this is something that is really hard if you're just working by yourself uh, having no one to discuss problems with um and then also well <clears throat> i'm german people always ask me uh, why i'm only releasing uh english videos or mainly english videos i want to have someone who helps me translate uh, the videos into german and also cater them to um, a more german speaking audience i don't know i think my dad would prefer watching the videos in german instead of in stuff english because uh technical english might not be something that everyone is really comfortable with yeah so yeah maybe growing a team uh or growing a team um of course getting new products on the market just have a sustainable business that is not as dependent anymore on ad revenue as it is i think nowadays so let's imagine it's the end of the world and your shop didn't survive uh you got to start from scratch so what's your first tool now the way i like to think about this question is it's sort of like um anything that that you need you could get right it's not like everything's been destroyed you could get to like the hardware store you could find a 3d printer somewhere or whatever but getting it is like really dangerous. So you've got to make sure you get the right thing first and then build up from there. Yeah. So if I want to be on brand, of course, I would like to have a 3D printer because it's it's a versatile tool tool to do many different things. If I'm probably being a more realistic, uh, if I'm probably being a bit more realistic, um, I would kind of stick to the Minecraft theme and get an X with, which which is a tool I can use to defend myself, but also uh, use it to cook something or use it as a hammer or a chop tool to build something up up from there. And I think it's one of the the most primitive tools, which doesn't require power, which doesn't require I don't know any infrastructure to use, but is a versatile tool to build up something and then uh, build new tools from it. Good answer, man. Good answer. I think there's a reason 
the hand axe is, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest tool we know of that you can find in like archaeological digs um, yeah. for the reasons you just said. So, yeah, I appreciate the uh, the well-considered answer there. I'm sure that most of your viewers have the same question I do, which is what are all the cool things on your shelf? So I'm I'm seeing like, I think I see a Stormtrooper helmet. Maybe that's a Nerf gun in the other cubby there. It Could is. you like show us some of the cool stuff back there? Yeah. Uh, give me one second. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I get it. So I think I gathered um, a bunch of things which might be kind of on brand to, to what I do on my channel. Um, this is like just a bent mini me where I did research in how can I do multi-access 3D printing? Um, how can I bend G code, which is a bit out of the box? Wait, that's not so that's not um XYZ, so this, like you actually Yeah, that so that's so that is XYZ printed, but a normal 3D printer is well, it's only a 2.5D printer. So you stack two dimensional layers on top of each other. So I tried to dive a bit into Mm, really 3D printing where all of the three axes of, of a 3D printer uh, print at the same time. So um, I kind of used two-dimensional G-code and bent that G-code um, over a spline to get uh, out something which looks kind of odd. So <laughs> the person right here, as I said, looks, looks kind of odd, but I had a real application for that. I had uh, I was designing a toy for my daughter and I wanted to have like uh, pipes printed, uh, which she can uh, uh, put on the window with suction cups and put balls through it. So um, instead of like designing the uh, uh, bent parts, I only designed like a, a straight cylinder, and I did a bit of math on the on the G code that it is not printed in a straight line, but it is printed following um, a spline, for example, which is really cool. nice. So, so the the printer is actually, it's, I th I think I'm I'm picturing what you're saying here, but it's <laughs> um, instead of doing a layer in two and a half D stepping up by a fraction yep. of a millimeter, it's it's actually going to be printing where some of the layers are where it's, it's continuously moving in X, Y, and Z. It's as if you were doing a, a 3D subtractive cut, but yeah. So how do you, how do you resolve like the, um, the layer thickness? Because if you're, if you're bending in, in like in this direction, right. Then the, the layers on the inside of the curve are going to be, um, those would have to be thinner than the outside, wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, it, it's quite So you just simple. do that with math. Like you're, the, yeah, you're just, just that smart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just do it. well. It's 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 not too hard to be honest because um, you well take the two dimensional G code, then you have your spline that's going through it. Take the normal of that spline, um, and then just calculate the distance of the end of uh, this this spline at two different locations or two different heights, and then you can adjust your print layer height or the amount of material that you extrude uh, according to that, which uh, which worked kind of kind of good to be honest in the end and i um did some uh really nice uh parts for my like daughter's window where she can now play with putting balls in these bent pipes cool is there a video about that already up there is there is g code okay. J just just google for it or a youtube search for g code bending g code bending okay yeah i'll have to check that one out must have missed it cool one, one, one of the one of the Big issues, and I'm looking at you guys now, um, about 3D printing is that the machines are very capable. They're easily able to move in three axes simultaneously, but software is, isn't kind of there yet. Um, for once, because 2.5D printing, so just stacking layer uh, on top of each other, works really well, is mathematically really simple. But to get the most out of this technology, we should actually do multi-axis slicing and printing in the end, but we're currently still lacking software. So um, okay. that's the reason why I'm looking at you. You guys do software. Uh, I want to see real 3D printing software in uh, the near future. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to get a meeting with the um, product manager in charge of additive <laughs> manufacturing later today. I promise. <laughs> okay. What else did you bring off the shelf? Uh, I, I brought another project that I recently did, and I, I think kind of shows the, the spirit of making. It's um, a small egg right here. This is my digital egg drop egg. Um, the the egg drop challenge is like a nice science experiment, but I was always annoyed that you get this binary answer from it. Does the egg break? Bad. Doesn't the egg break? Good. If you do a challenge with somebody, um, worst case scenario, both eggs are good or both eggs break. Who's better in the end? So I kind of put... Uh, um, an accelerometer, a microcontroller, battery display, and everything into uh, a small little device that you can now use for your egg drop challenges. And it will uh, tell you information about how bad the impact was. And this was such a nice challenge because it involved designing because I had to design a, a part which is the size of an egg and where I could fit everything in there. It was electronics because I had to put all of the electronics into this small enclosure right here. And it was also software engineering because I had to write software that the accelerometer is pulled um, a thousand times per second to uh, really get an idea about very hard impacts. And then also process that data, putting that onto an SD card and uh everything that is involved in, in such a project. And I think this is kind of like the spirit of making and kind of shows at which point we are at today because the average maker can now do something like that um, themselves uh, because everything is available. Software is available for designing parts. 3D printers are available to print these materials and you can just go on AliExpress or Amazon and buy all of the um, the electronics parts that that go into that. And uh, with all of the open source spirit and just the the ton of the, the ton of information that is available uh, online, it enables everyone to have an idea and make that idea into a product or maybe only just a working prototype. So we have an LCD screen right here in yep. the front. We have um, RGB LEDs in the egg, which illuminates everything from the inside. There's a microcontroller in there. There is an SD card in the back. There's a battery and there's a 200G accelerometer in the back. Everything just in a very small package, which is as big as an egg and almost as way, uh, almost weighs as, as much as an egg. So it's a perfect vegan, a vegan alternative <laughs> for the egg drop egg. I love it. What else you got on the shelf? Is it, were those the only two things? There are a ton of other things, I think, from interesting projects that I did. Um, Nerf Blaster, I think that was something that I saw on the, like the first big event that I went to. And then um, let, let me grab something else. Okay. There's got to be a Benchy, right? There's got to be a Benchy. I think this this is the model that I printed the most, but this is kind of a special Benchy because um, this was, I think, a very popular project that I did and also kind of shows the educational approach that, uh, that I like to do on my channel. So I printed that and um, just at the point where um, the colors now are different, um, the nozzle clogged and it didn't finish the print, but I wanted to have like this fully printed part. So I, mm, I resumed the print with some special methods measuring that out. And in a video kind of told my viewers how you can resume a failed print. And I think I released that video like two, two years ago and still like once in a week, I get an email by somebody uh, telling me how valuable the information in that video was so they were able to resume a 50 or 100 hour print um, and they did not have to throw that away and i think having the media of youtube showing how everyone can do something they thought wasn't possible before is is really amazing 
that's a that's a great example of the the work you do. I mean, it's uh, some of the value that's there. I mean, I know I've had plenty of prints that have like, you know, stopped halfway through and I'm 10 hours in or 20 hours in in some cases. Um, but yeah, man, you've got a lot to offer. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for your time. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, I always appreciate having conversations like this. Hey, everybody. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on all things Shop Talk. If you're ready to try Fusion 360 for yourself or find the link in our description.